the state of Tennessee and Commonwealth of Virginia launched a lawsuit against the NCAA for violating antitrust laws with its NIL restrictions. This is now the third antitrust lawsuit filed against the, the NCAA since November, but the first to attack NIL rules directly. Let's bring on National College Football Analyst Brandon Marcello. And Brandon, I want to start right there. For everyone calling NIL a whole free-for-all and not really knowing how it all works, what actually are the current NIL rules out there? Well, I'll try to simplify it, and I don't know if they're actually rules, more or less guidelines, that you cannot induce players before they get on campus with your NIL collective or a package. So in, in other words, you can't be like, hey, this is what you're going to get if you come to the University of Tennessee or West Virginia. Um, you also can't tamper, which has been the big rampant issue that is really at the center of a lot of the coaches and administrators' issues with the NIL regulations right now. Schools, officially and unofficially in some instances, reaching out to players currently on other teams to go, hey, would you be interested in coming here if we were able to give you an NIL deal through our collective, which we're not supposed to be talking to really and setting up deals for this act? And that's really, I think, the, the heart of the issue for a lot of people here mm -hmm. is the tampering. That's what the coaches keep talking about right now. But when it comes to the NIL rules today, that's really what it boils down to. It's just don't cross one or two of these lines and don't bring attention to yourself in doing so. Because the NCAA, as we have seen, they've got screenshots. They have slid into these DMs. They have got the evidence now. And now they're going to try and come after some of these schools. The issue is, is that... The NCAA is already hobbled. As you mentioned, all the lawsuits they've got, they're fighting five lawsuits right now. There will be more. In fact, the I'm hearing that the cases that were filed yesterday by Tennessee and the state of Virginia, I'm hearing that other states might be joining in on that here pretty soon. So again, the NCAA is being attacked from all ends right now, and it's going to be very difficult for them to see probably some of these investigations all the way through and to see if any of their uh, uh, rulings, so to speak, or punishments have any teeth in the long run. Yeah, it's not just how many lawsuits, it's the people involved. The Department of Justice jumped into one of those lawsuits. I mean, this is just going to continue to grow and it makes things very challenging for the NCAA. I, I said we wanted to show a little bit more of the letter from Dondi Plowman. Let's show this clip here. She says, it is intellectually dishonest for the NCAA enforcement staff to pursue infractions cases as if student athletes have no NIL rights and as if institutions have all been functioning post Alston with a clear an unchanging set of rules and willfully violating them. Brandon, the Alston ruling, which was a closed lawsuit, but another one, it opened the NIL floodgates. That is the reason that we have NIL as it is now. But she's arguing that that was just the beginning. So what could this latest lawsuit mean for the future of NIL regulations? Well, I'll say this. I think that what this is going to do is just potentially temporarily it's going to allow Tennessee or any other states that join in on this to go about operating under their own state laws and continue to do what they've been doing without fear of the NCAA really potentially coming after them or trying to enforce things starting on that date. So right now, the state of Tennessee and Virginia are trying to get a temporary restraining order put in place on February 6th, which is the day before signing day. Imagine that to where that day going forward, the NCAA probably couldn't, you know, punish them for any of these quote unquote transgressions, if you want to call them that going forward. But moving forward, what this is all going to come down to is that Alston case in 2021, because that opened the door to, listen, you cannot limit student athletes, as you call them, players, from going out to the free market and earning what they believe that they can be able to be paid. And the NCAA is arguing, well, we need an antitrust exemption. We are special. We go to Congress. We want to be able to put some guidelines around this and be able to restrain the quote unquote labor from being paid, which is the student athletes. This has been an ongoing fight for the NCAA for years, but in 2021 is when Brett Kavanaugh and the Supreme Court ruled 9-0 in a blowout, as you would say on the football field. You can't do that. You can't limit the players from earning what they believe they should be earned. And right now, the NCAA is trying to go back and say, well, we put these guidelines in place afterward because the schools were wanting some guidelines, but the schools are saying, well, we didn't want exactly these guidelines. There's blame to be placed on both sides of the aisle, so to speak here. But the issue is, is that the loudest 
voice in the land, the one that makes the laws and upholds them, the Supreme Court has said what the NCAA is doing and what they're trying to do right now is unlawful. And that's why these lawsuits are being filed quickly. And as heck, Charlie Baker, the new NCAA president, said back in January in an event I was, he says, Every day we're potentially getting lawsuits. He says, I'll probably get up off stage here and have another lawsuit in my mailbox. And it's and he's true because it's very easy to sue the NCAA now because of that Austin case. And that's why so many of us say that the NCAA really doesn't have any legs to stand on, because not only did the Supreme Court say what they did nearly three years ago, but now you have your own membership, which help break that help draw up those rules that you're enforcing as the NCAA saying, we don't agree with what you're drawing up, and we're going to sue you. So the NCAA, people say, this is, is this the death of the NCAA? I want to go that far. But it certainly is. The NCAA just has no teeth, and they're not really going to be able to go about and maybe limit programs the way that they maybe are hoping right now. But that's not going to stop the NCAA, from what I understand. Not to get too long-winded here, but the NCAA is investigating other schools right now. They're looking into other schools. It's not just the likes of Florida State, which obviously had been penalized just recently, and Tennessee. They're looking into other other programs. There's a couple dozen programs that they're looking into right now. Question is, is does the NCAA really want to go after all these programs? Because if they do, the state of Tennessee and the state of Virginia just showed, we'll sue your butts. We'll take you to court. Yeah, well, the NCAA has a, a lot more success when it's their investigation as opposed to when they go to court. Uh, but yeah, the Alston ruling just opened everything up with Justice Kavanaugh's opinion straight up saying the NCAA is not above the law, just inviting more of these lawsuits to come in. And so, as you said, yeah, this could continue to grow as it pertains to the NCAA. They make a point of not commenting on infractions cases, but they felt it was important to do so given the response. So this statement reads, in part, NCAA member schools and conferences not only make the rules, but routinely call for greater enforcement. This legal action would exacerbate what our members themselves have frequently described as a Wild West atmosphere, further tilting competitive imbalance among schools in neighboring states and diminishing protections for student athletes from potential exploitation. Love the last word, love the choice of verbiage there. Uh, but the NCAA in part says that it is trying to regulate because it's ultimately a governing body for its member schools. But Brandon, with, as we've said, five ongoing lawsuits, how much power does the NCAA actually have right now over college sports? There's so many things. We could talk about this all day. But the yeah. NCAA is not just 130 FBS schools. It's hundreds of schools. And it's not just football. It's other sports. And the, but the big issue here, of course, is college football and big-time college football. And when you look at the NCAA, what's the one sport that they don't actually run or look over when it comes to championship events? That's football. CFP does that. And so what we're really in the root of the issue here is, is we're really dealing with CFP, if you want to call it that, against the NCAA, because college football is completely different from what everybody else is. And for that matter, big time college football is. And this just brings up the question is, what is the future of the NCAA? I don't think the NCAA is going to go anywhere, but it's looking more and more likely that college football is going to have to break away, at least college, major college football and form its own entity, another NCAA, so to speak, that maybe is run by the CFP itself, or, of course, maybe some of these other commissioners come up with something else of their own. But it's very clear that the same rules that the NCAA is saying, hey, you guys wanted this, it doesn't pertain to everybody. Mm -hmm. Every school has their different issues. And for that matter, trying to say that St. John's faces the same issues that the University of Alabama faces every day is ludicrous. So... That's the root cause of all this that makes the University of Tennessee, the state of Tennessee, the state of Virginia be able to file these lawsuits. Because what they're saying is, is like, yes, you're putting out all these guidelines and stuff. We think they're ludicrous. Yeah, you say your membership's asking for this, but not necessarily every member's asking for this or to go along these guidelines. So, again, it's an absolute mess. And this is just another slow death march to some type of breakaway of college football and for players to be paid straight up as employees by the schools. We're moving toward that model. It's already a quote unquote semi pro model because of NIL, but it will be fully a semi pro professional model in the future. It's going to have to be 
There's going to have to be some transparency with this. They're not going to get the antitrust exemptions they want because the Supreme Court's already said as much. You're not going to get that. So they've been trying to do this for three, four, five years, even before the Austin case. Let's remember that to try and get some protections for them so they can continue not paying players. But it's very clear that they are going to have to pay players at some point. And again, I think the NCAA realizes this. That's why you've seen in January at the NCAA convention, Charlie Baker, the president, saying, hey, here's an idea. Let's start paying players $30,000, $50,000 a year from your schools and everything. I understand not all schools will be able to do this, but this is our idea. So he's saying that outside of one side of his mouth, while the other side of his mouth, which is the enforcement staff, is trying to say you can't induce players and do all this stuff. Yet in the future, the schools directly are going to be able to pay the players and work with the NIL collectives directly to set up deals. You can't have it both ways. And it's just really easy pickings right now for any attorney out there (laughs) worth their weight. Because they can earn a lot of money right now working for a school and filing these lawsuits. And again, this isn't the end of these lawsuits. More are going to come. More states are going to join. Some of these lawsuits are already active. You mentioned this part of it, the TRO. I want to pull up one more piece from Chancellor Plowman's letter, uh, kind of regarding that a little bit, uh, saying that any discussion about NIL might factor into a prospective student athlete's decision to attend an institution. This creates an inherently unworkable situation, and everyone knows it. Just laying it all out there. Recruiting in general, Brandon, (laughs) NIL or otherwise, is considered an inducement. You're trying to get somebody to come to your school. But the plaintiff is also asking for that TRO, saying that the NCAA cannot prevent players from engaging in NIL discussions prior to enrollment. You've mentioned this. I want to bring it back up because they want it to take into effect the day before next week's signing day. So if granted, what could this potentially mean? I don't think it'll do anything huge. What it's just going to do is from that day forth in the future, they can go about doing things the way they've always done them without any fear of repercussions. So no reverting the rules back to punish them for anything that's going on. It also opens the door potentially for more cooperation with NILs with schools. Obviously, that won't be as direct as what it is or what isn't is right now. But in the future, it opens the door for more things to come along down the line. I don't see this like being struck at the 11th hour. Then all of a sudden you hear Tennessee flipping a recruit from Florida because they were able to set up an NIL deal with them before they signed or something like that. It's not going to do that. But this is just protecting them going toward the future. And for that matter, that's why I think a lot of other states are looking at this and potentially joining the lawsuit. Whew. I think we need to take a little pause on our day jobs and maybe go get our law degree so uh, we can continue to talk about this stuff. Apparently this is sports coverage now, but uh, <laughs> we appreciate you uh, making sense of it all. Thank you. You can check out more of his work right here on this very YouTube page if you want some more Brandon Marcello in your life. Make sure you are subscribed, though, so you do not miss a moment, including our upcoming signing week. Get excited. 